Welcome, everybody. Sure glad to see you here today and uh, glad you can make it. Um, let's start with a word of prayer and let Jacob get going here. Father, we come before you today and we thank you so much for the way you take care of us. Lord, we're cognizant that we need to be praying for the peace of, it, of Jerusalem and Israel <laughs> right now. So many people uh, suffering over there and uh, the world in turmoil. But Lord, we know that you see it all, that it's within your hand and within your plan and you you know exactly what's going on. So we just pray you'd be with the folks there and also be with us and those who come to this Bible study. I pray that you would bring more people to this Bible study and that you would give Jacob uh, your message for us today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. We're continuing our study in First John. If you'll join with me, please, to 1 John chapter 4, Testing the Spirits. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I'll just highlight, well, maybe I'll just go through the some of the Greek. Agapitoi me panti numatai, pestuite ala dokumizite ta numata e ech. To deo estin hosti paloi, pseudo profetai. The ones who are loved with agape love don't believe every spirit, but test them or be ye testing. It's present active. Uh, be ye testing to see if they are of God or, or whether they are of God. The reason being that <clears throat> many false prophets, pseudo profetoi, paloi pseudo profetoi, many of them have come out into the system or the cosmo, the world, okay? Many of them. Next verse, verse two. And toto, genoskete topnuma. To theo pant numa, ho homologe, iston, Christon en sarke eluthota echto. By this, know, know the spirit of God, or know the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of God, it's not called the Holy Spirit, it's just the spirit of God. Every spirit no. that homologoi, is saying the same thing, homo lego, saying the same thing. In other words, avowing or confirming that Jesus is the Messiah, is the Christon, in the flesh having come. He's come in the flesh uh, from God or proceeding out of God. That is the spirit of God. Okay. Verse 3. Kai pamp numa home once again homologe ton yezon Christon and sarke el elutota echto teo och estin kai toto estin toto anti Christo ho ake ote hoti arke kai nun ento cosmo estin ide. Every spirit. Pond numa, that or which is avowing this, is, is confirming this about Jesus having come in the flesh, and that Jesus is the Messiah who was who has come physically from God, proceeded from God. In other words, he's pre-existed, he came from eternity, but in a physical form. Okay, who does who does not? Ochesten, who was not doing this, is instead uh, of the Antichrist, is, is Antichristo, is Antichrist. As ye have heard, or as you have been told, this is second perfect active, that he is coming, or it is coming, it's coming, 
And now it is in the world already. Now it is in the world, this Antichrist is in the world already. Verse 4. Whom is echtoteo este technia, little children, kai nenikati, you have prevailed against or, or conquered, autos hoti mezon, estin ho en humin, iho en do cosmo. You are of you are of God, little offspring. It's not just children. It's speaking to us as like as if we're little kids. Having conquered them or having prevailed against them in a spiritual battle, as it were, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world or in the system of the fallen creation. Okay? Verse 5. Auti ecto cosmo, esin dia toto ecto cosmo, la lucin, they are talking, kaiho cosmo alto alke. They are out of the world, they are of the world, of this fallen system, of the cosmo. Uh, and therefore they speak uh, as of that fallen, as of the, of the world, of the cosmo, okay? And the world is hearing them. The, the, the world, the cosmos is hearing them. In other words, we are from the Lord and of the Lord, and we listen to the Lord. It's comparing Christians to the unsaved, that they're of the world, they're from the world, and they listen to the world. Okay? Now, let's continue. Verse 6. Hemisek Torteo. Esmin ho genoskon, ton theon akoye, himon hos och estin ecto theo och akoye, himon ecto to genoskomen, tobnuma tes aletheus. We are out of or from God. Now, this is important. Hemis ecto theo. The way that Jesus is from the Father. He's the only begotten, of course. We are from the Father. We are from the Father. Him by birth and by eternal identity, pre-existent identity, but us by second birth. As he is of the Father, we are of the Father. Him, of course, by birth, come in the flesh. We, obviously, by, by means of second birth, we are of the Father. Our identity becomes in him, in lieu of the world. It's a juxtaposition contrasting us to the unsaved people. That's basically what it's saying. And it says that the one who's not of God won't, won't hear us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. He us is, of course, the apostles. He's speaking with apostolic authority. This is John, who's the last of the apostles alive at that particular time. He's speaking again as an apostle. <clears throat> for God, for God. So the world will not hear what he's saying. The world will hear what the world says. And as a result, will go the way of Antichrist. It's contrasting two kinds of people. Those in the character of Christ who are from the Father, okay, who who proceed from the Father, who belong to the Father, and who hear from God, okay? They hear from God. Or they're from God, they, and, and, and they hear from God, because they're of God, as opposed to those of the world. Those of the world, of course, will listen ultimately to Antichrist. Remember, Satan is the God of this world. They have their God, we have ours. They have their God, we have ours. In essence, this is what it is saying. Let's look at it once again now, having taken the nuances of the original language into account. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Discernment is not an option. Discernment is not an admonishment even. 
Discernment is a command. We are commanded to do it. Same as we're commanded to share our faith, to witness, to preach the gospel. Same as we're commanded to pray. Same as we're commanded to live morally. Same as we're commanded to study, to learn the word of God. We are commanded to practice discernment. It is not an option. Now, the lie of Satan in the church today is that discernment is being judgmental. That it is judge not who are you to judge your brother. This kind of lies presently being propagated by Satan's agent, Francis Chan. He's about the biggest advocate of it at the moment, but there's been others before him and undoubtedly others after him. But the biggest mouthpiece of the devil right now saying this is Francis Chan. He says you're defiling God's temple if you speak about false teachers and false prophets and so forth. Remember, Philippians 1, 9, that your love may abound in more, more and more in all knowledge and real discernment. For the agape, for the love of the Lord to abound, there must be a knowledge of Scripture, doctrinally, but there must be discernment in all knowledge and discernment. Without discernment, the love of the Lord cannot abound. Emotionally charged religi religious idiocy can abound that people mistake to be love. You can have an emotionally charged religious idiot, a, a idiocy, a counterfeit of the love of the Lord without discernment. The, the charismatic movement has been permeated with that garbage from the beginning, more or less. But you can't have the real love of the Lord without discernment. It requires the man's discernment. Now, this is not judgmentalism. It is not <clears throat> fault-finding or witch-hunting. But when Scripture says something is wrong, when God says something is wrong, it is wrong. Once more, we've warned many times, do not listen to the religious liars who mindlessly misquote out of context, touch not my anointed. That, of course, in Chronicles, Psalms, and in uh, Samuel, all goes back to David in the cave of Ein Gedi. No, David would not touch Saul because he was God's anointed. But did it stop David from telling the truth about Saul, that he was a backslider and a murderer? Or did it stop Samuel from writing the truth about Saul? Or from the Holy Spirit, from inspiring the truth about Saul to be recorded for all eternity in God's word? No, he was a backslider and a murderer. Those people who say, touch not my anointed means, you stand back and you let people do <coughs> teach error, and mislead the church. When you hear somebody say that, as I pointed out many times, you are at best listening to the religious babbling of an ignoramus. You are at best hearing the religious babbling of a pseudo-spiritual ignoramus. They think they're being Christian and loving and wise by quoting the scripture out of context. Now, we've talked about these things many times. Discernment is a command. People who do not discern in the last days particularly, we do not say and we have never said that those who don't practice discernment in these last days, in these, shouldn't say last days, but yes, last days, but in the close of the age, those who do not practice discernment are not going to be deceived. They won't be deceived. Simple reason is they are deceived already. People, believers, Christians, who are not practicing discernment are deceived already. Now, the ultimate test of this is Scripture itself. We are not following the instructions of the Lord if we do not practice discernment. It is not an option. We're not talking about witch hunting or fault finding, but when people in praxis or in doctrine, when they teach and do things that are contrary to scripture directly, we have to uphold what scripture says and say this is wrong. 
And when people teach it, they must be challenged. The way the apostles and Hebrew prophets challenged them, the way Jesus challenged them. These things are not options. Pastors who will not do this are called hirelings, hirelings. They're not faithful shepherds of the Lord's sheep. They are hirelings. Now let's look. Many false prophets have gone into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Okay. This passage, verses 1 to 6, deal with false pneumatology. False pneumatology. It's about the testing, discerning of spirits. Now let's begin with the discerning of spirits. It's like any other charismatic gift. All Christians, or any other ministry gift, all Christians are commanded to read the Word of God. But not every Christian has the gift of teaching to expound it under the anointing of the Spirit for other people. All Christians are called to witness, but not all Christians are called to preach the gospel to large crowds as evangelists. Okay, simple. That, that's, that, that's right. Okay. Well, the charismatic gifts work the same as the ministry gifts. Okay. We do not all have the gift of discernment of spirits. Some do and some don't. <clears throat> Not every Christian has the gift of being, of having the gift of discernment of spirits. Some do. But every Christian can be discerning. What's the difference? When you're discerning, <clears throat> you're testing things on the basis of God's word. The Holy Spirit might show you this might not be right or check this out or something like that. When you're led of the Spirit particularly, but if something disagrees with scripture, it's wrong. We are to discern, is this scriptural or isn't? Is it contrary to scripture? Is it scriptural? Or is it maybe possibly something neutral? That's not the gift of discernment of spirits. That's something we're all supposed to be able to do. Ideally, young believers have to grow into it, new believers. The sermon of spirits is where somebody has the spiritual insight into an individual, and they say, I discern a spirit of this, or I discern a spirit of that, and it's right, and it's accurate, and it's proven to be accurate. Some people have that gift. I've known people with that gift. Frequently, the people with that gift are women, but not always. I've known men who've had that gift. It's a charismatic gift. Some have some do not. But that does not mean we're not all discerning. It does not mean we are not all discerning. Okay. There's a gift of faith. We all have a measure of faith, Scripture says. But there's a charismatic gift of faith that some people have, some don't. The Holy Spirit reveals something to them, and they have the capacity to trust God for something to come into fulfillment because the Lord has shown it to them personally. They have the gift of faith. But we all have faith and we couldn't get saved. There's a difference between the gift of faith and a saving faith, or the measure of faith we all have. Well, there's a difference between discernment of spirits and being discerning. Now, in this false pneumatology, in this testing of spirits, the text highlights Three features. Three features. One is a false Christology. When it is a wrong spirit, something about Jesus is either held, is believed that's either false or in some way unscriptural, what's being taught or said about the person and the centrality of Jesus is misrepresented or ignored or distorted. 
there is some degree of false Christology, where you have a false spirit, where it's not the Holy Spirit, it's inevitable that the person of Jesus is in some way being suppressed, ignored, misrepresented, distorted, something like that. Okay. We'll come back to that in a moment. This becomes related to Antichrist. Antichrist. When the real Christ is being ignored or misrepresented or distorted, the spirit of Antichrist gets in. Remember, the Antichrist of the two beasts in Revelation, he will ultimately personify that the way Jesus personifies truth. The Antichrist will personify falsehood. He'll be, as Jesus is truth incarnate, the Antichrist will be falsehood incarnate. Jesus came in the flesh. The Antichrist will ultimately come in the flesh. But the Spirit was already preparing for the coming of Jesus in the flesh before he came, and the Holy Spirit is preparing for his return in the flesh. So too, simultaneously, the Spirit of Antichrist, working through, as you've heard me say, the zeitgeist, the Spirit of the age, is preparing the world, unbelieving Israel, and the apostate church for the coming of the Antichrist and false prophet. That brings us to the next feature, you will see a false prophet. Wherever you see a counterfeit spirit, you will see the activity of a false prophet or false prophets in some way. Where there is a false pneumatology, there will be false prophecy. Where there is a false Christology, there will be antichrist in a spiritual sense at least, ultimately a physical sense. So too, the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, we're told in the book of Revelation. Therefore, Satan being the counterfeiter, will you see a counterfeit spirit, a false spirit? You will not only see something to do with a false Christ, you will see a false prophet. Now, we deal with this in our book, Shadows of the Beast. I won't go into it now. I will only touch on it. John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. He confessed Jesus from his mother's womb. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist was filled with embryonically. A unique man was John the Baptist, okay? He pointed to Jesus. The false prophet in Revelation will point to the Antichrist in the way John the Baptist pointed to Christ come in the flesh. A huge subject, and it has implications for the return of Christ. I'd point you to the book if you haven't read it, Shadows of the Beast. I only mention it insofar as it relates to the subject at hand from 1 John 4. Let's continue. So we see where you have a false pneumatology, you will in some way have a false Christology that will in some way relate to an Antichrist spirit and ultimately the Antichrist, ultimately. Second, you will have some kind of false prophet or false prophets third thing that happens when you have a false pneumatology is you will have false doctrine. They will not believe the teaching of the apostles, of the New Testament authors who were trained by First John, some of them, and by Jesus, all of them, and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the New Testament. They, in, fa in effect, reject apostolic authority because they're rejecting the authority of Scripture. And when you reject the authority of Scripture, you reject the authority of Christ. He is the Word. He is the Logos incarnate. 
Don't believe every spirit. So many Christians with good intention are so naive and undiscerning. They see something, it tickles their fancy, and they're all over it without judging it or testing it because it initially seems appealing to them. We must be careful, all of us. Even more experienced believers can be taken in up to a point with this kind of thinking. There's a woman who's a deceiver. She has false visions of a false Christ or claims to have. But because she came out of a New Age background, people think Doreen Virtue is the greatest thing since sliced bread. But she tells an artist about the Jesus who appeared to her and has him painted by her description, and he was never crucified. <laughs> More than that, there can be visions of Christ, but there cannot be an apparition. He does not come to earth except the way he left when he comes on the cloud. There are no apparitions of Christ. There can be visions in rare circumstances. But when you see Stephen had the vision, Christ was in heaven. Paul heard the voice from heaven. When you see people saying Christ has come to earth and appeared to me, that's an apparition. It's not the real Jesus. Hers was not even crucified. The Jesus that whose statue that Chris Roseboro prays in front of, dressed up in his Babylonian costume. That's not the real Jesus. There's no stigmata. There's no crucifixion. But because she was New Age, oh, with New Age, you got saved. Isn't this wonder? And they're all going. Believe not every spirit. She was selling books. Well, let's continue. There'll always be a false prophet associated with a wrong spirit. Now, we are told the following. The fruit of the spirit, and I've said this 10 million times, is ikrete, self-control. The New Testament says that twice. When you see people out of control, it's because God is not in control of them. If the Holy Spirit is in control of someone, they will be in control of themselves. When you see people on the floor having conniptions and barking like dogs and in drunken hysterics, this cannot possibly be the Holy Spirit. I remember when I went to that freak show in Toronto, I didn't go to get the blessing. In fact, it happened to be in Toronto for other reasons. But while in town, I decided to check it out firsthand. And one of the things I noticed of the people waiting to get into the freak show was nobody was talking about Jesus. They were all talking about the experience. I was shaking and I couldn't move. I know it was God. Too ignorant to realize that by the fact that you couldn't control it proves it could not possibly have been God. You hear people say crazy things. When the Spirit of the Lord comes on me, hallelujah, I have to prophesy. No, you don't. The Spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Be careful. Charismatics are not careful. They're biblically ignorant and they're not cautious. They're not discerning. Now, I'm not a cessationist. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit but I realize the realities of what has happened and what is happening and what's going to happen. These deceptions are increasing as we speak. With the new apostolic reformation and things like this, it's very dangerous. A group of false prophets recently put out a statement signed by people like Asher Intrader and Francis Chan and Dan Juster, people who have dangerous beliefs that are not scriptural, that are just not scriptural about prophetic ministry. Very dangerous. When you see false spirits, you're going to see false prophets. That is what you are going to see. They will always be around. Now, Remember, there'll be a false Christology in some way. 
The Holy Spirit always points people to Jesus, never himself. Always to Jesus, never himself. He's only addressed in prayer in the context of the triunity of the Godhead in Scripture, as we know. He points to Christ. When you see somebody writing a book like Good Morning Holy Spirit by Benny Hinn, that's false pneumatology. Therefore, this false Christology. The Holy Spirit will point people to Christ. He'll make you say, good morning, Jesus. <laughs> Only Jesus doesn't sleep. <laughs> we do. Is Benny Hinn somebody who's predicted things that don't happen? Yeah. He said all the homosexuals in the world were going to die about 12, 15 years ago. And one day they didn't. Is, is, is Kenneth Colton a proven false prophet? Yes. Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. Holy Spirit, we worship you. Or the people who teach these things, people who have prophesied falsely. Yes. Look at the people who, teach, who said Donald Trump was going to win the election. Look at them. Did they prophesy falsely? Yes. Did they make specific predictions that were time-specific in the name of the Lord that failed to happen? Yes. Does that mean that they're false prophets? Yes. And notice they haven't repented. They'll do it again. And people will let them. They don't test the spirits. Beth Moore and these people, whatever you, Cindy Jacobs, all the, when you see this stuff, a false pneumatology, there'll be a false Christology. And with the false Christology, you will see a false prophet in some way, making God's people trust in a lie, as Jeremiah 28 puts it. The next thing you will see is they will reject the teaching of the apostles. They will reject New Testament doctrine. But let's backtrack a little bit. Now notice what these people have conditioned people to say. Okay. Do you have a love for the brethren? We know love by this. Will you lay your life down for your brother? By the grace of God, he'll empower us to should we need to. But does that mean we don't speak out about false brothers who are misleading the church or about true brothers who are misled? If you love a brother, you'll tell him that's wrong. It's a trap. Back down to chapter 4. Remember, it's always a matter in interpreting Scripture correctly, rightly dividing the Word of God. Rightly dividing is exegesis. Text, context, co-text. We all know this. It's the text, context, and it's the co-text. I'd seen two, I'd almost describe it as violent abortions <laughs> applied to this passage of scripture. One is by people who are, tend to be cessationists or tend to be reactionary. They point out correctly that in the Sitzimnebin, in the historical cultural setting of this writing at this time, John was addressing a false Christology that came to be known as docetism. Docetism. 
Docetism says Jesus did not come in the flesh. He only appeared to be human. When he walked on the beach, he wouldn't leave footprints. I'd mentioned this before. They deny he came in the flesh when he was born. And many of them deny he's coming in the flesh when he returns. You see this today with the cosmic Christ, with the New Ages, with Matria, and those who identify the return of Christ symbolically with their cosmology of the age of Aquarius, things like this, the New Ager into this. Dangerously, Dominion theology toys with this. Christ returns to the church through the latter day reign before he returns for it. They're toying with it. John was, and we can deduce this without reading anything into the text, addressing an incipient docetism. I agree that was already becoming a problem at that time. It would become a bigger problem later on. Irenaeus and so forth addresses it later on. Irenaeus got his doctrine from John via Polycarp and so forth, but John is addressing this. It doesn't state the term docetism, but the description is pretty clear that's what it is, or at least an early form of it. Okay. This you know that the spirit, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you've heard it's coming and now is already in the world. It is true to say that those who are docetists have an Antichrist spirit. Those who deny that Jesus was born of the flesh, they have an Antichrist spirit. They're correct in what they say. But the text read in context does not make that the definition of a false spirit or of someone who is deceived by it. We'll continue with this. In other words, these people are right in what they say, essentially, wrong in what they omit. Now, these people generally tend to be believers. These are not false brethren necessarily. In fact, they're usually not false brethren. They may be, but not necessarily by any means. The majority of them aren't. They are Christians. What they say is right. What they fail to say is the problem. They're not reading the text in context. The others, well, I'll tell you a true story, another sad saga. This goes back to Australia in the early to mid-1990s when the laughing drunken counterfeit was coming out of Toronto, Canada, and it found its UK home in Great Britain. One of the meccas of it was Holy Trinity Brompton, pastored by Sandy Miller and led by the bosom buddy of the papal chaplain, papal chaplain being... Uh, Renero Cantamalisa and his Anglican bedfellow, Nicky Gumbel, the author of Alpha Courses. And the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Australia from a church called Paradise, located in Adelaide, came to Holy Trinity Brompton to see about the blessing and to get it and to encourage the Assemblies of Gods in Australia to get on board with it. He was actively opposed by the former General Secretary of the Assemblies of God in Australia, Philip Powell. They knew each other quite well and served on the same executive. Philip Powell was against it, knew it was wrong. He was the nephew of a rather prominent Pentecostal preacher and a very good one in Britain, David Powell, his uncle, he opposed it, but Andrew Evans, the general superintendent, pushed it. And someone in Adelaide gave me a recording of what Andrew Evans told his church and what he told the Assemblies of God in Australia. 
Now, after Andrew Evans retired, Hillsong took the whole thing over. Hillsong took the whole thing over, in essence. But what he said was this. He went to Holy Trinity Brompton and he saw all these prominent people who were there, the, you know, the, the whole bit, the who's who of London Christian society and one of them. And that was supposed to give, I suppose, lend some kind of credibility to his endorsement of the laughing drunken phenomena, which he wanted in Australia, and he particularly wanted the Assemblies of God to embrace. He was a commensurate theocrat. He was not a theologian. He was not a pastor. He was just a theocrat. And he said the following. So I called up Rodney Howard Brown, <laughs> he said. And I asked Rodney Howard Brown, do you believe Jesus Christ came in the flesh? And he said, Rodney Howard Brown said, yes. So he said, there, you see, this thing must be of God. Rodney Howard Brown is not a false prophet or a false teacher. He believes that Jesus came in the flesh. So does the Pope. So do most false prophets. So do a lot of people. Does the text say, by this you will know a person, or by this you will know a spirit? He takes the text out of context. He takes something which in context is talking about a spirit, discerning a spirit. And he misapplies it to the individual who believes or follows or is empowered by that spirit. Now, the text does explain the relationship between false spirits and people. In terms of false prophets will propound that false spirit. But it's talking about the sermon of spirits, not of people. What the general secretary, superintendent of the Assemblies of God did was he took something talking about discerning spirits and applied it to dis discerning if a person was of God or not which has nothing to do with what the text says or means. It only even indirectly relates to it, but it's not what the text is about. It's about the sermon of spirits. Believe not every spirit. Test the spirits. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. And he said, oh, because these Toronto people believe Jesus came in the flesh, they can't be the false prophets that other people are saying they are meaning Philip Powell and this other discernment ministry that was in Adelaide. That was a discernment ministry that witnessed to cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Christadelphians. But they came out and they produced a video saying Rodney Howard Brown in Toronto was all counterfeit. And this got them into a big fight with the Assemblies of God leadership. All these people in these discernment ministries are wrong and Philip Powell's wrong. That's what they were saying. And the argument was, because Rodney Brown and Copeland and either whatever, all of them, because they said they believed Jesus was literally born biologically, not physically, of a virgin and so on. He came in, the, that was the proof of the pudding to them. Therefore, all this other stuff must be right. And people believed it. It's not talking about the test of a person. The test of a person is you'll know them by their fruits. The fruit of the spirit is self-control. We're told in Galatians. Not the lack of it, not some maniac on the floor imitating an animal. And they were saying that was God. Well, wait a minute. The mind of a beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar. 
It was God's judgment. If it was from God, it was his judgment on them. In the Bible, when that happened, it was a judgment, not a blessing or a revival. It's God's anger. To take a human being created in the image and likeness of God and reduce him to the behavioral level of an animal, that was God's judgment. Now, of course, this had a lot to do with things like kundalini yoga and things I won't go into it. We have many teachings explaining this over the years. But that was his argument. And people bought into it. Now, what we have to do is go back. So we have the text. He didn't read the text. The text said it's about discerning spirits, not people. And he didn't read the whole context. Either did some other people who only took it and applied it or limited its application to the subject of docetism. Valid in what they said, but the text does not stop there. First, let's look at the elements to get the context. John, in this chapter, speaks of people with the false pneumatology as somehow as a result of the false Christology that comes from the false pneumatology and because of the influence of the false prophets that accompanies it, will be of an antichrist spirit. We have to look at what else John said in this same epistle to understand the context. As we've studied a few weeks ago, he spoke about the antichrist in chapter 2 and the appearance of the antichrist. Notice he says the word children again. He uses the same language, children, antichrist. In other words, it's a letter. Like any other letter, you cannot extract one paragraph or sentence from the letter in isolation from the rest of what's in the letter. He's referring back from chapter 4, and there's no chapter divisions in the original canon, to what he said in chapter 2 about Antichrist. You have to read what he says about the little, calling Christians little children, faithful Christians little children, and warning about Antichrist. This, in chapter 4, relates directly back to chapter 2. Okay. And they went out from among us and what they behave like, and you know, the, but they were not really of us. And, So these false prophets are in that character. They're not really of us. But let's continue. You're from God and have overcome them because greater is he who's in you than greater is he who's in the world. Now that is the general truth we all like. It's a favorite verse. Of, 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 of many of us. He was in you was greater than he was in the world. That's true. When we overcome temptation, it's because he was in us is greater than he was in the world. That's true. That's true. But in its immediate context and focus, it says that we have already overcome the spirit of Antichrist because of who's in us. If the true Christ is in us, the false one can't get into us. If we follow the true Christ, we will not follow the false one. The apostate church will follow the false one. 
because they have abandoned the true one. But the emphasis on Tikkunan, of children, little children, even young believers, even newly saved people, can and will be protected from Antichrist by Jesus. Discernment, yes. Doctrine, yes. All that's important in the identification of the Antichrist. But the protection from Antichrist can only come from he who is in us. Identification is something else. But protection, the true Christ occupies the place so the false Christ cannot. Let's continue now. He moves beyond the implied reference to docetism. And he says this. In verse 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus. Notice the following in verse 2. This you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh. But every spirit that does not confess it is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. Okay. Verse 3, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Notice verse 2, once again, the spirit that confesses Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, but the spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This, therefore, will include the element of docetism in the previous verse, its antecedent. But it's not limited to that. It moves on. Look what it says once again. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus. You see all this false pneumatology once again. Singing hymns to the Holy Spirit that don't mention Christ. Praying to the Holy Spirit outside of the triunity of the Godhead. Let your fire fall, come Holy Spirit. All this craziness. This emphasis on the Spirit. And it's not only the emphasis on the Spirit, it's on the manifestations of the Spirit. So-called fire. You see Rodney Howard Brown now, even in 25 years, 30 years later, pushing people over in his church, yelling, fire, fire, fire. You see Michael Brown, who prophesied falsely in Israel, saying that the national forest fires that destroyed 22% of Israel's forests and killed, forest, as killed firefighters and soldiers. He said that was God pouring out his Holy Ghost fire on Israel in the last days, and there's going to be another Pentecost. That's a crazy man, Michael Brown, the apologist for Pensacola, who's now into the, what with the Bill Johnson crazy thing up in Bethel, California, Michael Brown. And you see him, I, his videos, fire, 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 fire. Notice these people with a false pneumatology do not point people focally and centrally to Christ. If it was the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would be pointing people to Jesus. Jesus said, when the Spirit comes, he'll remind you of all I have taught you. He's the servant of God who points us to God's Son. Let's 
Look at the text. Verses 2 compared to verses 3. By this you know the Spirit of God. Everyone who confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God. Okay. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That is the spirit of Antichrist. They're not confessing Jesus. The focus is pneumocentric instead of Christocentric. It's not from God. And it will ultimately be used by Satan to manipulate the apostate church into following the Antichrist. But then look what comes after that. You're from God. Greater is he than in the world. Verse 6. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world. The world listens to them. We're from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. People with a false Christology will always reject apostolic doctrine. A familiar passage to us, look very briefly at 2 Peter 2. Verse 1, false prophets arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Peter treats the two terms, false teachers and false prophets, almost as if they were synonyms, that they were synonymous terms. As we've always said, if somebody's doctrine is wrong, their prophecies are going to be wrong. The reason people prophesy falsely and predict things that don't happen is because their doctrine is wrong. False prophecy and false teaching go hand in hand. They reject the teaching of the apostles. You say, this is not scriptural. Oh, you're judgmental. You have a critical spirit. Notice they won't dispute what you say. <laughs> they won't challenge the points what you say. What they will do is usually go into some kind of empty religious rhetoric. Oh, the letter killeth, the spirit giveth life, without even knowing what that statement means. Or you have a head knowledge, we have a heart knowledge, as if the two are mutually exclusive. If the heart knowledge is real, you're going to want a head knowledge. You're going to want to understand it. If the heart knowledge is real, you're going to want to understand it intellectually. And God will help you. They will always cop out. Now, by this, we know the spirit of truth from the spirit of error. We have a teaching that we did some time ago. I believe it is available on the Internet for free download called the spirit of truth, the spirit of error. Therefore, there's no need to go into it at length, but I'll just highlight one or two points relative to 1 John. Look with me to what John wrote also in John chapter 12, quoting Jesus. Jesus goes away and hides himself, and John quotes Jesus about being the light of the world in verse 36. You may become sons of light. This was a theme well understood even by the Essenes, the struggle between the sons of darkness and the sons of light, and this comes into play very powerfully before the return of Christ. But he says, goes on in verse 36, these things Jesus spoke as he went away and hid himself from them. But though he performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing. This was to fulfill the word of the prophet Isaiah. Lord who, Isaiah quotes Isaiah 53, Lord who has believed our report, <clears throat> to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay. 
Notice they would not believe. They would not believe. They just chose not to believe it. Whether it was true or not, they just chose not to believe it, irrespective of its merits. Factually, the factual merit meant nothing to them. Secondly, it continues. For this reason, in verse 39, they could not believe. For Isaiah said, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. Notice what you see, what you perceive intellectually and what you believe in your heart are not mutually exclusive. They are not mutually exclusive. They are mutually dependent if you believe the truth. If it's really in your heart, you're going to believe what the scripture says, what you read in God's word, what you see from the evidence. But then Isaiah, verse 41, said this because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. And it said, nevertheless, even many of the rulers believed in him. See, they knew. Many of them knew. But it was in their religious self-serving interest not to acknowledge it. I have known many people. I have known Baptist ministers, Anglican clergymen, Pentecostal preachers who knew so many things that were happening are not of God. They knew it, but they wouldn't ever say it or act on it. They wouldn't say it publicly. They were just like the Sadducees and Pharisees. Would not believe, could not believe. But then, as Isaiah said, they should not believe. <sighs> what a thing. You wouldn't believe, shouldn't believe. Now you can't believe. This is the spirit of error. Again, we know Romans chapter 1 three times. God says it concerning homosexuality and lesbianism and those who compromise with it. I point you to our teaching on entitled on Sodom and Gomorrah entitled Not Even a Minyan. For this reason, God gave them over, it says in Romans 1. Then it says it again. For this reason, God gave them over to believe the lie. Third time, for this reason, God gave them over. Concerning the Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians, therefore the Lord sent a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. The false prophets of Ahab, when confronted by Micaiah, I will put a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. I'll make them believe the lie. Zechariah 11, Antichrist, the Lord's mighty agent. You want false prophets? Oh, God will give you a false prophet. He'll be from Satan, but God will allow it. You don't like the real Christ? <laughs> don't worry, there's another one. The Lord will let you follow him. Not only that, the Lord will cause you to do it. In judgment, these things are very frightening. These things concerning Antichrist specifically are very frightening. The apostate church is given over. Unbelieving Israel, having rejected the true Messiah, is given over. These things you see happening this week in Israel, it's all setting the stage for Israel's false peace treaty, all of it. Orthodox Jews, we want Messiah now, we want Messiah, <laughs> yeah. Abraham Accords, a false peace in the Middle East, all of it. You reject the true one, don't worry, there's a false one. Just for you. <sighs> Spirit of error. 
homosexuals and lesbians are given over to the spirit of error in Romans. Once somebody's given over to a spirit of error, it's almost imp not impossible, but nearly impossible for them to repent. Those who compromise with them, who give hearty approval to these things, are given over to a spirit of error. The Lord will send a delusion upon them. Spirit of error. When God gives somebody over to believe the lie, even though the lie may be of the devil, that's somebody who's doomed. Now we have another tape or teaching dealing with this called the spirit of truth, spirit of error. But realize it's what happens. False pneumatology, false Christology, false prophets, false doctrine, ultimately a false Christ. False pneumatology, false Christology. Right? False prophets, false doctrine, and ultimately, they're given over to a false Christ. It's the spirit of truth. And it's the spirit of error. Now there's the text. And there's the context. Looking at the co-text, the other passages of scripture, and John and Peter elsewhere, Jeremiah, that speak of these same issues. It's impossible to say that people who do these things are not false prophets. All that's only about docetists. Now read the whole text. Read it in context, and then read that in light of the co-text. Remember, Going back to Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus in the New Testament and other places in the Old, taking the text out of context is always Satan's game. It's a game he plays very well. He lost the match to Jesus. And he will lose the match to to those who have Jesus in them. But to those who are in the world, <laughs> he's won the game already. And that includes the apostate church. Discernment is not an option. Where you have false pneumatology, a false doctrine, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is counterfeited. You're going to have a false Christology. When the Holy Spirit is counterfeited, Christ is going to be counterfeited. There will be false prophets, always, and false doctrine. And ultimately, <laughs> a spirit of error. On one hand, these things are indeed frightening, foreboding. Words of woe, very discomforting. On the other hand, these words are very encouraging, <laughs> very upbuilding. Very much something that gives us an assurance. He who is in you. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. God bless and thank you so much. We'll be back continuing with 1 John chapter 4, Lord willing, next Thursday, same time. We have Catching Up with Jacob coming tomorrow. It should be posted either late tomorrow or 
Saturday. And Saturday night, 11 p.m., we'll be looking at First Thessalonians chapter 5 on the Word for the Weekend on RTN and Moriel. Please join us then, 11 p.m. UK time, which is 6 p.m. Eastern time, 5 Central time, 3 p.m. West Coast time, uh, early morning, 6 a.m. in Western Australia, uh, and then 10 in Eastern Australia, and 11 in New Zealand, and 6 in Singapore. <laughs> Hope you got all that. Thank you so much. Look forward to having you with us over the weekend. God bless. Thank you.